Welcome back to the podcast for small businesses. Today we have Brandon on and we're going to, going to be teaching you about financial literacy. It's going to be the main topic. So Brandon, just to start us off, to get our listeners to get to know you a bit, tell us a bit more about who you are, your story, why you're passionate about finances. Yeah, so I grew up in a small town in Utah. Pretty small. There was about maybe 700 people in my high school that graduated. And I grew up in that family. My mom was an engineer before I was born. And then she left engineering to raise me. And I remember every conversation I have, everything I go, I point everything back to my mother. I had the best mother in the world that raised me so well. But we struggled a lot financially. My father didn't really have a great job. And my mother was making that sacrifice. So we were taking that step back. And that's just life. But at the end of the day, what brought me to finance is as I moved out to here to Hawaii, and as I was in Utah, I was looking for a lot of small jobs or a lot of small jobs. And you've probably seen it. A lot of jobs you feel irreplaceable. It's like, oh, you're only filling me. I'm only here for fill a position. I know in five days you could replace me if I was to like pass away or anything was to happen. I was looking for something that actually means something to me and actually had an impact, but also like create something that actually matters. I think that's what brought me to finance, that's what brought me to business, that's what brought me to Hawaii where I'm at right now. Because I was like, you only really live once. And you can give a lot to the world, but what you give and the, why life means anything is because it's short. And I just want to give as much as I can to the people around me. The noble goal. I think that's, when we circle it down, at least when I look at successful people, that's one thing they all have in common. They all want to give back in some sort of way. For example, with me, one of my missions is that to be in a position where my family and friends can call me and I have to and can always say, don't worry about it. I got it. That's one of the things that really drives me. And one of the things that stuck out, stood out to me on your LinkedIn profile is no family left behind as your mission. Could you tell us a bit more about what does that mean? I think it's what, what you talked about, like every family is going to go through a situation. If it's either a cancer or a heart attack or another financial situation where someone's going to call and be like, hey, I need the funds. And it's like, at the end of the day, can you write the check? Can you write the check to help your family out? Can you write the check to help your children out? Can you just write the check to put your family in the best situation? And no families left behind means we've probably seen it a lot. Our government tries to help families out. Our jobs try to help families out, but they're just doing the best they can. And there's still families left behind, we can probably agree, that don't have the financial education, don't have the financial systems, and don't really know what they're doing. The knowledge out there in finance is pretty diverse, and it's not very straightforward education. It's kind of confusing. Yeah. And that's kind of the point. We want to teach people how to actually fish, how to actually learn, and to actually um be put in a situation where they can make their own decision when it comes to finances. I like that. Even the poor middle class that's been left behind. That's, those are definitely the people that is left the most behind, it, it feels like. Mm -hmm. And where where does this like go come from? Because I remember last time we spoke about how to fish. Could you, because people haven't heard our last conversation since it like wasn't recorded, could you just elaborate a bit more about what you mean of how to fish? Because that was something that really stuck out to me as how you were different compared to your competition. 100%, 100%. So I think how to fish comes down to maybe one or two things. First off, you have to teach information, but information is not enough. You have to teach instruction of how to like actually do anything. We have all know Goldman Sachs, right? Goldman Sachs, they tie people in, they have fees built in, they have people that come constantly, help them build their wealth, right? There's also companies out there that just give advice. We like to meet in the middle, we like to help people out, but also give advice and put people in the best situation. When it comes to how to fish, we don't wanna just put people in the best financial situation, and then that's it. We wanna make sure that they can educate their children that they can educate their family, that they can pass the information on, that we've taught them, which goes into our, what we were talking about leads. Referrals is a huge part of our business, just because we're actually helping families out. They're getting educated and they're like, oh, 
I didn't learn this in school. Oh, I didn't learn this in education. Oh, I've never known this my entire life. Let me connect you with Braden that's rolled my 401k over, put me in the best situation to retire so I can actually retire sometime. Yeah, like word of mouth, there's nothing, no more powerful marketing tool out there. So is, do you mm -hmm. ask for word of mouth or is it generally because you offer so good of a service that people just want to promote you? Um, it, it goes back to doing good service and get, having a good product, but also educating your clients of how to use word of mouth. And that's a mouthful and it's pretty hard to do, but at the end of the day, your customers or clients have to know how to communicate about your business. Yes. <laughs> just like you do. You have to teach them, hey, this is about how you introduce us. This is what you, how you introduce me. This is who I am. And they've already met you. They've already seen the services. So if they're like, oh. And then you ask them very blank, like, who do you know? Who do you know that you could introduce this to? Let me teach you how you could introduce that to them. Do you and then they continue with the relationship. Maybe in the first meeting, obviously in the first meeting, no one's going to refer you anyone. No. Maybe in the first month, no one's going to refer you everyone. But we're gonna, we have quarterly or annually meetings with our clients every single year, every six months. See where they're on in their financial progression and build that relationship. So do you offer... Which is how you actually get the referrals. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. I, I love you. You talked about you actually have to, to teach people to do it. It's like just... Mm -hmm. Let's say you open a new restaurant and you don't tell anybody. Nobody's going to show up no matter how good your food is. You have, gonna, you have to invite people to the party you're hosting. Otherwise, nobody's going to show up to your party. And I think that's why a lot of small business owners do get lost because it's all about offering the best service possible. Which definitely, it can work. Like if your service and product is good enough, like Zoom, for example, that's how they did it. But for most people, that's not going to work. And going into the question I wanted to ask you, when it comes to those referrals, do you like offer a commission for your your clients? We do not. Okay. So is there a specific reason for that? Because that's definitely one of the, the things that, to me, and I look at it when mm -hmm. I'm talking to people, I'm referring people, I'm looking to the. I'm looking first of all who provides the best service, who can actually solve the problem, because that's what it's really about. And then, like number two is, how like how much do I get out of it? Because humans are generally selfish. But first of all, can is it actually what they're looking for? So so it comes down. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I think it's like a restaurant though. Like you don't refer a restaurant just because they pay you. You don't refer a restaurant just because it's just like you get something out of it. You refer a restaurant because you like want your friends to have a good experience. It, say you're in town, you're like, oh, this is a good restaurant. And I think people refer me not for the commission. They refer me because they got a good service and they want their friends to get a good service. They want, it's like a, introducing, I heard something earlier. It's like introducing someone to a, a new friend. Like they mm. found me and they want to refer me and they don't really know anyone else that does what I do. I really like that way of looking at it. Like look like when you're wanting like introducing your friend to your friend because you, you think to yourself, Are these people will probably love each other. They'll probably right. form a great friendship and that's the only reason why I wanna do it. Mike, you've been very quiet. You probably have some questions on hand. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm really curious to know financial advising and helping people invest. This is this is something most adults will tell you to your face that they think they can do it on their own. How do you go about showing people that that's not actually true? We just show them the numbers. If you show them the numbers and stories that make sense. The economy crashes every eight to 10 years. If they're 40 to five to 55, they've seen it. They've watched their 401k go up and down, up and down and up and down and up and down. And they're kind of tired of it. 
and it's you can hit them. I don't want to say hit them where it hurts, but if you can hit them where it hurts, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it makes sense. You need to. You need to. Then they need to feel yeah. you. They need your product. It's very so. What 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 draws a client to you as opposed to going to someone like Fidelity or Fisher or Vanguard or whatever? Uh, and I'm asking this just for all our listeners because everybody's yeah. everybody's in a crowded market. No matter what business you start, you have competition. So how do you differentiate yourself? I think first off, the, the, what's it called? The main thing, we get a lot of referrals. So the main thing is just like, hey, they choose me over like Fidelity because I got referred to from a friend ah. or for someone that's trusted. Second is we don't charge fees. I know a lot of big companies charge fees to even see if you can do a service or see oh, if yeah. you can work. We don't charge a fee unless we can actually do something. So we do a free budget. We do a free investment. We, do, we send free information. We send free books. We send free videos. Like everything's free unless we can actually help the family out. Now that's a big differentiator for sure. Yeah. And for the listeners that may not be in tune with what I'm saying here, most of the finance and advisory companies that you would have heard of charge anywhere from 1% to 1.5% of the total assets you put with them in order to manage those assets. But very little is, is given away up front, like what Braden's talking about. So that this, is, this is a very good differentiator. What are some of the common investing and money myths that you run into that you educate people about? Um, first off, it's just like, there's not one size fit all. I feel like everyone's just like, oh, I'm gonna do this one size fit all model. And there's not a one size fit all. You have to actually look into how much money you're making, your background and what you actually want to achieve, your age and how you long you want the money in. That relates to what you actually invest in. And then I feel like too many people look at the stock market as a way to get rich when it's just basically gambling your money away. Like the stock market wasn't built for the poor and middle class. It was built for the companies and for the wealthy. And if we even look at rates of return, if you have $100,000, you lose 50%, you're 50,000. If it goes up 50%, you're at 75%. You're at 75,000. So you actually have to even double your money to actually get you where you want to go. When most Americans think, hey, you're at 100,000, you lose 50%, you're at 50,000. You go back up 50%, you're at 100,000. That's not true. No. <laughs> you got to know the math. You're just at 75,000. Yeah. So stock, stocks are shares in companies. Yeah. Which are generally sold because the company's trying to raise capital for one reason or another. What if you're not doing uh, stocks? What do you put your clients' money in? So we, we try to put our clients in money places where they can't lose. Mm. So what we do is we do debt management. We do an emergency fund. We use a high yield savings account. We use a fixed index annuity, Roth IRAs, IULs different things like that. So obviously things that not everyone can qualify for, but we know we can build a floor in place where we're not going to get a phone call one day. Hey, you ruined my entire life. Yeah, and this is an important principle that I want all our listeners to really zero in on. Most responsible asset managers and investors are going to tell you the same thing. Take the money you're going to need. That goes in your low risk investments. If you're going to invest in companies, whether it's through stocks or through private equity or whatever, that's a different pot of money. That's money that you are, you know, you can lose that and be okay. So make sure you get that in your head, folks, because it's a super important point that Braden just highlighted for you. You never know what one of these wild CEOs goes out and does, and the company can go bankrupt the next day because they got <laughs> caught in a bad place. It's happened before. Like that's... Well, and uh, yeah, the uh, the classic case of the uh, guys in the computer department at Bear Stearns trading on their own. It was illegal. <laughs> it was illegal, but yeah, they they cost the company over a billion dollars in that crap. So yes, yeah, <laughs> so it's not always the CEO. The next day, if you do that, sometimes it's, sometimes it's just the guy or girl behind the keyboard that somebody wasn't watching. So going like into specifics, like how, like what kind of split? would you recommend for an average person? I know it's a very broad term, 
But we don't have time to go into every specific situation on this episode. Um, split meaning money in big account, money investments, money in yes, exactly. Like long-term retirement. Ex exactly okay. what I mean. Okay. Everyone should have three to six months of income in their in their high yield savings account. I don't really use the normal savings account. It's point zero one. High yield savings account is usually three to five percent. It's a better yield savings to actually keep up with inflation. So that's where you would put your emergency fund. Because the vehicle is just as important as the money you have in it. Then everything else, you'd either put, you put, uh, so 25% or whatever it is. It obviously is different by every person. But we all know when emergencies yeah. happen, you need to have it next month. I would at least put 25% for long term future money you don't have to touch within the next 25 years, 30 years. This is the 401k, TSP, retirement accounts. Money that you know will grow and compound just because you don't have to touch it. And then I'd put everything else, because you know your money's not going to grow in the bank account. It's not going to keep up with inflation. You know you're going to need money right now, but you still want access to it and you still want the growth. I would find put the rest of that into something like that. Definitely. Thank you very much for sharing it. I don't know too much about what the different things are as a Dane. I can make some parallels, but this was more for American audience, which is definitely still a majority of the people out there. Uh, one of the things I learned our audience likes are stories. So could you sh maybe share a story about like a, like one time where you really felt like you made a bit made a big difference for a client? There's a lot. First off, like my mother that I helped, she had her old 401k account. We were able to roll it over and she's looking at retiring even five to six years earlier than oh. she thought she was going to do, which mm. is kind of a lot if you just look at the numbers. Yes. Five years. And then I, had, I have an aunt. We met with her, my mom's cousin, because at the beginning of the business, every business is done differently, but at the beginning of your business, you have to just tell as many people as possible or no one's going to do it. So I was like, hey, mom, give me all your contacts. Hey, dad, give me all your contacts. Hey, brother, give me all your contacts. And I called them all. So I could just show my business to as many people as possible. But yeah, my mom's aunt, she has all this money, right? And she was crying and she wasn't sure she was going to actually, what to do with it. She's been dealing with what I was talking about before. How she has all this money in this IRA. But when they put the money in, similar to a lot of things, people don't understand the vehicle. Mm. They don't actually understand the fees. They don't actually understand how it works. They haven't read the tax codes. I'm like, hey, that's, a, that's the thing I, I recommend at the end of it. Like, you can invest in whatever you want, but invest in things you understand. That's very Pretty much at the end of the day, though, is she wasn't going to be on track. What we're looking at doing is putting her in the best situation to actually move that money. And it's not going to have a ton of growth. Just to be honest, she's a little bit older. It's not going to have a ton of growth. She doesn't have that much money. It's not going to make 100000 not going to be a million dollars. But she's actually going to grow. Because people on these accounts, like a mutual fund or whatever, IRAs, money that's not growing, at the end of the day, you want to have growth. You want to actually keep up with inflation. You want to actually reach your goal. And you don't want to deal with the diminishing returns. Because that's what the wealthy have been doing. The wealthy don't lose money. The ah. wealthy grow their wealth. The wealthy get richer and richer. And it's not even most of it. Their money is not even their money. That's debt. All of it, basically. All of their money is debt. So we talked a bunch about like actually understanding the vehicle is important. So where is some places if the audience want to learn more about financial literacy that they can go? You would recommend. 100%. So there's a lot of stuff on YouTube. Obviously, YouTube's not the best. But what you can do, you can definitely check out my LinkedIn. I don't know if you're going to refer it down below. Yes, yes. exactly. Down Everything. Below. Check out my LinkedIn. We'll reach out. We'll discuss. Usually we do one-on-one -on -one meetings with people. Just educate them. I have books. I have some videos as well that we send our clients. And then 
there's a Tony Robbins book about financial advisors where he interviewed financial advisors. That's a long read. It's a good read. And they're just tax codes. I don't think many Americans have read tax codes. I don't think many people read tax codes. They're kind of boring, just to be honest. But you want to actually see how your money's taxed. Because mm -hmm. yeah. that's kind of a big way that money actually works. Yeah, like tax deductions is is the easiest way to make more money in, in most people's lives. Because you actually, if you don't, don't do your taxes, you're surprised of how much money you got to save. Like, for example, I had a friend this summer. He never did his taxes. And I just did this, like, simple 20-minute, like, um, check for his taxes. He may, is going to make 20K more a year because of just, like, 20 minutes of work was 20K. I made a $1,000 a minute for him, basically, and that's every year. I'm just going to compound crazy. And I, I, I know the basics. So just teach yourself the basics is going to make it like a massive difference. I love you mentioned that. And the thing is people are like, so when it comes to your expenses, they're so like meticulous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's but when it comes true. to taxes, they're so nonchalant. And you, that, when it's like, that's your biggest expense. Yeah. You, you can actually have a lot of fun figuring out how to legally pay your U S taxes and still maintain as much money for yourself as possible. It becomes yeah. a chess match. It's kind of fun sometimes. Yeah. Uh, the best feeling is getting to know I got to pay the government less money. Yeah, like, exactly. Every time when I do my tax returns and I see how much I save, I feel excited every year. So, Brayden, I do have a question. Yeah, for sure. You started a business. You've already shared with us about the very, very important step of talking to everybody you know and everybody they know and without even trying to sell, just showing the business to people. And this is such a, an important phase of any new company because it, it helps us sharpen our how we present it, how we talk about it. It helps us figure out what questions people are having that we didn't think about. What else would you share with our audience on running a business? Something you didn't know that you wish someone had told you when you started? Probably is not going to weave you one big break. Mm. There's not going to be one day you wake up and it's like, oh, I got it all figured out. It's not going to be just the client you meet with and you're like, oh, I'm rich. There's not going to be one <laughs> person and it's like, oh, my business is completely changed. There's not going to be one hire and it's going to be like, oh, my business is forever secure. It's just showing up every single day and building it every single day. I think that's a, a beautiful message. And... The things that we hear where it's actually, let's say it's a story about, oh, they had one employee in their business turned around. You don't hear about all the years they put in the business before that moment of small incremental steps. So when they, like, when you get there and it's like that one big client, it doesn't feel as big as it sounds to people that hasn't been there. What is, what is some, like, one common mistake you see in, like, other business owners you speak to? I think it's growing the child too soon. Mm. I, th I see a lot of people, what's it called? Either throwing the towel too soon or not all, all committed. They have to like burn all bridges. But when it growing the um, towel too soon, I feel like obviously you have your business, right? That you have your idea of when you're starting. You're implementing your idea. You're adjusting it. And you're creating the business that actually is out there, actually helping out families, right? Actually doing their services. Throughout the entire process, you're just experimenting. The business hasn't even started until this. Right. But I feel like people like throw in the towel pretty much here uh, when they're still trying to figure out what the business is. That's It's like Facebook. If you want a social network, it's like, yeah, we can't run ads. We don't even know what our business is yet. That's very true. And they were like, they were like three years in. Oh yeah, yeah. It was it was really fun watching that company grow. But but you're right. And Braden made a good point for the audience. Every every time you saw the founders of Facebook in the early years, every time they did a presentation, they make some kind of comment like, "We have no idea what we're doing, but this is where we're going." Or we don't know how we're going to get there, but this is a road we're on. Yes. Were, and that's okay. Very that's very clear. Work. Yes. 
you just gotta experiment, try new things, do different things, see what works, see what doesn't work. There's no one finished brand. I like, it's just a brand and process. Yeah, I like to, when people mention that to me personally, I like to take them like five years back in their life and start asking them a bit of questions about where we're going, all of this, and oh, well, how was that compared to now? And then pretty soon they realize, oh, yeah, I, I never really had it figured out. I never really know exactly what's going I know where I want to be, but I never really had an idea of, of how to get there, an exact, exact idea. And like, no plan ever survives contact. And even right now, like I have a lot figured out, but there's still things I'm trying to figure out. And like my business isn't at its final form. Yeah, you're always like a new level, new questions. That's why I, I, I'll, of course, it's good to like think about before you start doing something, but I like to set a very strict timeline on how much time I have to think because it very quickly turns into a lot of unnecessary thoughts and like you don't end up using half of the things you considered, like half of it was just a waste, if, if not even 75%. Uh, we talked about a lot of people throwing the town to, towel too soon. Yeah. What was the thing that made you keep going and not throw in the towel? I think I'm just playing an infinite game. Mm. Could you elaborate a bit more about what you mean? I'm curious. It's like what I've been talking about this entire time, but the infinite game, it's like business isn't the answer. The solution isn't the final form. Like I'm playing incrementally better, incrementally better, incrementally better to my, the business that gives me the lifestyle that I want and my family the lifestyle that I want and helps out the most number of people that I can. And that doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen by helping one client. That doesn't happen by hiring a great employee that happens by actually putting the work over time for the longest time. Keep on, like, look at those small improvements. Very true. 100%. Right? And it's good to have goals. It's good to be like, hey, yeah. you in my business in the first six months, I'm going to make $5,000. In my first three years, I'm going to make 100000 But also you need to have your daily processes built in of how you're going to do that. Of just, hey, this is what I'm going to do every single day. That's going to reach me, help you reach that goal. Yeah, like focus definitely like you want the big picture. You want to know where you're going. It's hard to find something you don't know what is even. And as you also mentioned, you also need to know how to, to get there. Like mm -hmm. It would be the same if I gave you a map and you were in Europe and I said drive to Hamburg from here. And you only get to see that map that one time. I have no chance of finding Amber. I think that... But if you drive enough, you'll find it. Yeah, that's... If you drive enough, if you don't run out of gas, it's not a small city. You, you, you definitely... You won't miss it. Just go to wherever you hear the loudest techno music. Then you're probably getting <laughs> close. Is this something you want to leave our audience with? Before we end here? Um, I don't know if I can think... I... Been, I don't know how many of you... I've been studying the life of Warren Buffett. If you look at the life of Warren Buffett, he made most of his income after he was 65. Right. I think, huh. at the end the of the compounding. Day, yeah, it's a compounding. Six, 30 years of, hey, not very much results. 20 years of struggle. And now he's pretty well off. His family's pretty well off. I think the principles that he followed, I wrote it down on my Instagram. But it's just delayed gratification, sticking with something even with little results. Work, you have to put it in. Research, study, put in the reps. And then have a mentor. Success doesn't happen in a bubble. You gotta bounce off others, be coachable, and learn the skills. And I think that's what changed my life, is I actually found someone that I was interest, interested in what I was interested in, and building something that I was interested in. And I was able to build that with him, and be my co-founder, me and the people around me, we all have the same dream and the same goal. Obviously, we have different goals and different dreams, but we have the same process how we can achieve them. So just that's... finding people and making your inner circle the inner circle you want. That's very, at least what I, from my vision, very similar to how we operate.
I would say. So we talked a little bit about people can connect with you on LinkedIn. Where else, if people want to to get more about what you do, connect with you, can they reach you? I'm going hard on Instagram. I heard an assistant. So at Coach Braden, dot Braden Watt is my Instagram. I'm on there pretty much every day, just to be honest, I'm trying to just reevaluate do the process, how to get that platform down. But I've been teaching business, doing stuff there as well. So cool. But also on LinkedIn. We make sure to to have those links down below because I I hate the people that don't do it. So you have to <laughs> to listen back. Oh, was it what was it you said? A good try and type it yeah, in. Yeah. And then the the, the the like your name is is not bad, but like some names can have three different letters in one space. Oh, which one is it? It's um, <laughs> it's a struggle. Well, thank you very much for coming on. It was yeah, a real thank pleasure. You.